So now that we've established some of our earth and geography basics for this course, we're going to move, be moving on and talking about the sun because really we can't move too much into talking into any real depth with uh, uh, talking about the earth without also addressing the important influences that the sun has upon the earth. And so here in this lecture we're going to be talking about solar energy and essentially the relationship between the earth and the sun and the series of relationships that are so important. So really fittingly our song for this lecture is in the mood to talk about the sun is Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. So you can see our sun here in the background this nice image uh, taken uh, by NASA satellites. And so really when we get into uh, how we're going to be getting into this lesson is is taking a number of questions that you may have had you know, at some point in your life where you, you know, maybe you already know or you think you know the answer to some of these questions. But we want to make sure that we um, cover these bases before we move on to talking about other topics um, in terms of, of, of the Earth. And so we want to be able to identify, well, what exactly defines a day? What defines you know, a longer time span, a year? And you know, kind of tied to those ideas, why do some places seem to have seasons throughout a year? Why others do not? So why does a place like Eugene you know, change seasons and have warmer or colder temperature depending on the time of year? You know, why does the day length um, vary throughout the year um, and location? And, so, and also, you know, not only asking these questions, but asking just as we built upon our scientific method, also how do we know these things? You know, we want to make sure we're always kind of bringing that back uh, and asking, you know, how has this been verified? And you know, how have we gone through those steps of the scientific method and to claim that we actually have those, that knowledge? And how have we gone about testing our hypotheses? So I want you to just pause here for a second. You can write down some reasons why you think, uh, you know, some answers that you think you have may have to these questions. We're going to be then coming through this lecture and addressing those. And so first we'll address, address these in order. We'll go through the uh, what defines a year and what defines a day. And then for the why seasons, we really have a few different possible hypotheses that I've drawn up here for us that we'll address in turn. I'm going to go through and so and I lay this all out more in the lesson that you'll be reading as well but you know, there was, we could hypothesize that I mean, one reason for seasons is something like distance from the sun we we'll actually have the earth throughout its season or it's throughout a year actually does vary in distance from the sun we you know could also have that the sun does over time have a different emit emittance and energy so you know maybe perhaps seasonality is due to more energy being emitted sometimes they are in less energy emitted than others or it could also have to do with something with sun angle in the sky it, it could you know it seems um, perhaps that if you know the sun is either at a more or less direct angle determines whether generally it is warmer or colder and so we'll be able to go through each of those in turn and talk through reasoning those again based on a background and kind of testing wise a little bit of that scientific method so first I want to note our revolution and rotation, which are tied to a year and a day here. So we can see that revolution um, would refer to Earth's movement around the sun in an ellipse. Um, and it's kind of that long oval around the sun. And that is actually then what ends up defining a year. So one whole uh, revolution around that ellipse, um, which takes us approximately 365 days, although I have some videos that explain that out more in detail. It's not quite that simple, but you know, approximately that 365 days uh, is our year. And then the, uh, of course, rotation, as we see here, here with our GIF on the right-hand side, the Earth's spin, kind of rotation upon its axis is what defines a day. So one full rotation around, uh, once again, it would determine a day. Again, that not uh, we generally define also as 24 hours, once again, there's an, uh, other videos, once again, that complicate that, um, considering it's actually not quite 24 hours, it's just under 24 hours for for that on average. So that does vary, and again, there's a video that, if you really want to get more into the detail of that, um, we'll cover some more of that. So now, now we jump to this question, our next question, now that we have established what it essentially defines a day and what it defines a year, we move to this question of why seasons? And so again, we want this. I'm going to have you. I have you doing this more in detail as well in the lesson. But really, I want you to engage directly with data that actually 
you know, has, and since it can help us answer these question, this question, we go through these each in turn. So first, this is one of the hypotheses that I drew up for you of why we could have seasonality, that being of solar irradiance, referring to the amount of incoming uh, radiation, as we'll look at in the next lecture, but essentially the amount of incoming energy from the sun to the earth. Um, if we, we have ability to measure that with with technical instruments and that is what is being shown on this graph so we have on this graph actually, along the bottom here we have uh, from 1880 AD all the way essentially up to present time moving from left to right and then we have solar irradiance being measured uh, on the vertical axis and again this is essentially a measurement of the amount of energy coming in uh, per unit area to the Earth's atmosphere from the sun. And so you know, we want to note some things here. So we can note that, of course, we can see this changing over time. Um, and we can um, note, uh, though, on the vertical axis, really, we're only looking at about a difference of two units of solar irradiance over this over 100 plus year time span. And so really, we're not, you know, for the number that we see on the side there, so from varying from 1360 to essentially 1362, watts per square meter of this measurement of solar radiance. You know, really, for that large of a number, that's um, you know, a number well in the in the thousands. Um, you know, a, a change of two units is very minimal, if at all, really. And also, you know, we're noting here that we're looking at this over the span of 100 plus years. But is there really anything here to indicate a you know seasonal influence or you know? We can see this kind of up and down by yearly pattern, uh, as, as measured by the individual dots along this line. But is there any real seasonal pattern to this that we can discern? And hopefully, you would be able to say no. It doesn't. I, I don't think there's really any you know, seasonal. There is an up and down throughout many years, perhaps, but not on the scale of an ind individual years when we see that seasonality occurring. So here, it doesn't seem that this solar irradiance is really speaking to being able to you know, match up with the reason for seeing seasonality. So to bring in also then now another Beatles uh, reference. So we already talked about revolution. So if we're talking about, you know, we're saying we want a revolution. We want to talk about revolution, not in the sense of a social revolution of, say, the political overthrow of governments, but this revolution we've now identified of going around the sun, the earth going around the sun in defining a year. You know, again, the, noting that that Earth's orbit is elliptical or this kind of long oval shaped and its distance does vary through one revolution, we can identify that there's specifically two time periods wherein the Earth is closest or furthest from the sun. So we call the time when the Earth is closest to the sun the perihelion and when the sun is furthest or excuse me, when the Earth is furthest from the sun the aphelion. And note that the perihelion occurs on approximately January 3rd give or take every year, and the aphelion occurs on July 3rd. Now if we think about those times, so again, the perihelion being when Earth is closest to the Sun, if we think, you know, probably intuitively that it would make sense that if we are closer to a very hot object, and you know, we could think of this maybe such in an analogy to a fire, if you move closer to a fire, you should generally get warmer. This seems actually kind of opposite to what we would think, you know, what we observe yearly, right? You know, these don't, you know, these the perihelion and the aphelion actually aren't matching with what we expect in the northern hemisphere season. You know, actually when we're closest to the sun is about the coldest time of the year for the northern hemisphere, or, or you know, if we live in Eugene. And when it's the aphelion in July is actually usually when it's one of the warmest times of the year. All right. And so this doesn't seem as well when we look at that in that manner that it, this is also not a strong influence on our seasons. So we then go to our third hypothesis of sun angle. And we can note that we, that sun angle also does vary throughout the year as we've already uh, look, kind of looked at a little bit. Um, but it also is set up for you to look at more in detail within the lesson, lesson five here. And so to note that Sun angle, as we find out, because it is at its highest point uh, at you know, essentially when we would term in the middle of the summer, and 
then is at its lowest point in the winter. This seems to match up, uh, and it, indeed we find is the most important uh, part that really defines seasonality varying throughout a year. Um, and so to note that um, really then when we bring this uh, to the Earth and look at it at more in a full scale, uh, to note that um, not only through the sun angle being important, but also that there's a note that, you know, that remembers that our Earth is not oriented vertically uh, or spinning on its axis vertically up and down as we think, um, as being intersected by what we call this plane of the ecliptic, or that would uh, run through the middle of the sun and, and through the Earth. Rather, it's tilted. We have this axial tilt uh, that the Earth is rotating around. And so that's about 23 and a half degrees. And so that, just to remind ourselves, remains constant throughout a, a revolution around the sun. And so to, um, as we can see through some of the figures here, in this one showing here, once again, we have that plane of the ecliptic, uh, so that would intersect the sun, uh, intersects the sun as well as our Earth. But again, our Earth is tilted on its side there, about that 23.4, 23.5 degrees, um, and so rotates about that t uh, tilted axis. But again, that always remains that same, about 23.4, 23.5 degrees uh, tilt um, throughout the revolution around the sun. So that is known as axial parallelism. The axis always remains parallel, pointed in the same direction as we then see in this figure as we have our, our, the Earth's revolution around the sun. And so with that, this is what then leads to our annual progression of the seasons. We're talking, and this is all and more set up for you as well in the lesson. We're talking through, um, we have both solstices and equinoxes um, when the sun varies um, and goes over uh, different latitudes at different times of the year. So essentially, the sun is more overhead directly within the northern hemisphere um, from between March uh, all the way up to its maximum extent over the Tropic of Cancer, about or that 23 and a half degrees north, um, the subsolar point, or again where the latitude of the sun is directly overhead, is, is at its greatest extent at that June 20th or June 21st, and then moves starts moving back uh, after that date towards the uh, equator again, is overhead the equator in September, and then moves into the southern hemisphere, so September, October, November, December, and then reaching its greatest extent over, overhead in the southern hemisphere, uh, and overhead point that 23.5 degrees south uh, latitude for what we would term in the northern hemisphere our winter solstice uh, in late December there, that 20, December 21st or 22nd, but then the sun starts moving back north again and towards the equator and is once ahead again overhead the equator back in March and by that time we have one revolution and we have our year All right and so we can see this also visually here as shown in this image and all this laid out explained more in detail I'm kind of pushing through uh, a little bit in brief here um, compared to as is laid out for you in the lessons uh, for this module and so we also see this visually here set up where we can see the sun being directly overhead and on the left hand side here with the June solstice uh, again that tropic of ca cancer in the northern hemisphere and so this is where, again where northern latitude locations get much more sun uh, direct more more direct sun angle and kind of conversely we move into what we term the winter solstice or again winter months um, that sun being very uh, the least directly overhead in the northern hemisphere so this, the reason behind this, why we end up seeing, you know, or why this ends up, why sun angle is the most important part of, I mean, or, or characteristic of, you know, determining the seasonality we find, is, is can be shown by this simple image here. We're seeing that when the sun is you know, perpendicular to, or the, 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 the energy coming in from the sun is perpendicular to Earth's surface, as we see kind of over here, where we have this unit, uh, in this case, a one mile kind of across coming in, when that comes in perpendicular to the Earth's surface, you know that one mile um, coming in through Earth's atmosphere and then reaching Earth's surface, also essentially heat is able to hit the ground and heat up uh, that same area on the ground, and so essentially all of that energy that is coming in from the sun is able to be translated directly to heating the Earth's surface. 
However, we can see then uh, you know, next to this where we, if we have that same you know, amount of energy coming in and now but now at an angle this relatively low angle of only 30 degrees above uh, you know the uh, parallel with the Earth's surface so 60 degrees still from being that directly overhead or perpendicular as we just looked at in the last example now when that energy comes in because of its angle you know and it actually ends up getting spread out over the twice the Earth's surface distance um, on the ground and so you know we have that same amount of energy that is coming into the Earth's surface but all that that amount of energy has to now heat twice the amount uh, or twice the area of Earth's surface in that second example because there's you know essentially less energy to go around per unit area or you know has to be spread out over a much larger area all that area gets less all that area gets heated less so generally it ends up being cooler because of that and so that you know would be more a winter circumstance that you might see in the uh, northern hemisphere about where we live compared to the sun being much more directly close to overhead in Eugene. Now to note that as you'll be looking through some of the lessons and lectures here as well to note that you know the sun doesn't actually ever get directly overhead in Eugene. I want you to explore a little bit more why exactly that is. Well, I've kind of already talked about it just here to some extent just to make sure that we recognize the sun is never directly overhead but it does get fairly close again most in the summer months. Now through all this conversation I haven't really brought in a whole that whole another question that I brought up at the beginning of this lesson then along with this issue of day length and asking this question of well, why then does day length also vary throughout the year based on location and to note it's really tied to some of these same things that we've already been talking about so it's really this combination of axial parallelism and revolution throughout a year that ended up leading to you know, this very range of distribution of uh, locations having different day length throughout the year. So you can see this on this graph that's also been providing a lesson that shows you know, really varying from, at different locations. We get a, uh, you know, really from the equator to either the poles, we have much difference, a lot of difference um, between day length. So again, we can actually see by observing this graph that at the equator, um, if you live on the equator, actually every day is in terms of daylight, um, is the same. So the amount of daylight that you get is 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night every day. Where then as you start to move further and further away uh, from the equator in either the north or south latitude directions, we get more and more variation throughout the year, which is, becomes maximized at the poles. So we can see at the by the time we reach two very high latitudes and the poles, we're getting very large swings uh, up to complete swings. Um, you know, at the poles, we can see actually half of the year we end up then having essentially 24 hours of daylight or constant or constant day, and the other tw um, half of the year we have this constant, uh, you know, no hours of daylight or essentially a constant night time, and so you know, we have that extreme variation at the poles, um, you know, and but we get some kind of in between of that. In the location that where we live, so about 40 to you know, 45, 44 degrees north, approximately where we are in Eugene, we have kind of that variation. Where we get a little bit more, you know, a few more hours of daylight in the summer, and a few less hours of daylight in the winter. There's in turn then for ourselves and kind of more um, issues, social issues that we're interested in, also becomes relevant in talking about how we actually perceive and keep track of time on Earth. Um, and so this manifests in a couple different ways. We first have this issue of local time versus time zones. And so to note that we've already talked about latitude and longitude, and we've noted how along any line of longitude, so those vertical lines, our day length varies. We just saw that in the last slide. And to note that then also along any line of latitude, the height of the sun in the sky also varies, as we just looked at in these past slides. So essentially meaning that in any combination of latitude and longitude, that local time based on day length and the height of, or that angle of sun in the sky, um, you know, the local time, if we were to base on the sun, varies by location. And so I lay out in the lesson how really this is 
you know, historically prior to about the year 1900 AD or, you know, really prior to the late 1800s AD, the main way time was kept was to simply you know, use the sun as a guide, but how really with increasing you know, connectivity of the world, you know, lots of transportation like the train and steamships and later then even cars and planes and you know these means of transporting not only lots of people but lots of materials across their surface and you know right in, in and engaging in economic trade and migration of people you know really led to a lot of difficulty of you know, all different locations essentially holding their own time local times became you know very difficult to to keep converting um between when something might, you know, people or goods might uh, depart or arrive from different places when they were trying, you know, it all on different clocks and, and had their own local time. And so this was what led to the establishment of eventually in more these time zones, where as you know, we have these large swaths of area that we can see run more vertically um, or, you know, oriented along a series or you know, several, uh, covering several uh, extents, uh, several degrees of longitude. And so, note that we can see now how this has been established. So to note, this is really a political or social construct, and that you know societies or individual countries um, end up determining how they want to exactly define where these um, time zones are. And so that also then determines, in turn, kind of tied to that, um, is where the international date line uh, ends up being. So that being the line that determines actually one day um, from the next. Um, since on a, a constant rotating Earth, we you know we have our night and day, but essentially, how do you define in terms of a calendar day where that is split? I mean, that's defined by the international date line. And also, then this then in turn you know, with our um, our pre and post module that we saw uh, for this uh, module also leads to the idea of daylight savings time. And so I'm not going to belabor that point here. But to, you know, that is explained out for you in this series of links that I provided to you. I want you to explore that, you know, and be able to come up with an argument you know, to some of the questions that I ask you within the that prompt. And so, not only how do we know kind of you know, what is the physical basis to you know, some of these physical processes that we've talked about and why how that leads on to the idea of why we might want to have daylight savings time. How did it come about as it presently stands? And then I want you to make an argument. Should we keep things essentially as they are? Or should we move to abolish daylight savings time? Or should we establish it all year long? You know, those, that's the question that I want you to build some sort of argument for. Based, again, basing that in part on this material that you're going to go through and engage in all these series of links. So that um, brings us to the end of this lecture. And then now we'll move on from here to um, talking more about Earth's atmosphere, We're talking about that more of this energy and the incoming, not only the incoming energy that we've talked about from the sun throughout much of this lesson, but also then the outgoing energy from Earth into outer space.